May the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be ever mindful of thee, O Lord, my strength and my salvation. Amen. Would you please be seated? This morning I want to talk to you about our gospel reading. And it's the wedding at Cana, where Jesus turns water into wine. It's uh, one of the better known miracle stories about Jesus. And usually it gets brought up in debates between Episcopalians and Baptists. In other words, did Jesus really drink? Should we drink alcohol? So on and so on and so forth. That's all nice and interesting, but I think there's a deeper meaning, at least one that I see in my studies right now. Different times of my life, different things are more and less important. But what I take away from the story of the wedding of Cana is the same question that I take away from the story of the Good Samaritan. Who is my brother? One of the remarkable things about Jesus Christ is that he upended the whole notion of responsibility and obedience and of love. It's a notion that we hold today. It's more important to take care of my family. It's more important for me to get out on top than it is for me to take care and to love and to be with and in fellowship with other people. And if you walk through me, it will, if you walk with me through the story of the wedding at Cana, I think you'll see some remarkable things. So, it's going to be a different sermon this morning. I probably won't get as excited as I normally do. But I do want you to hear where I'm going with this. And, and if there's a Bible in the chair underneath in front of you, it might be fun to look through because we don't have the, the leaflets printed anymore. Now, the wedding at Cana is the first of Jesus' public miracles in the Gospel of John. It comes in the second chapter. And there's some things that it's so familiar, I think many of us don't hear what's actually being said. Now it begins, on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. There's a wedding. Now in, the, in those days, and even to this day, weddings in traditional Muslim, Arab, or Jewish, or Middle Eastern uh, families were big deals. In our culture, we get our extended family gets together for Thanksgiving or Christmas, or we talk to our uh, relatives over the internet. But we didn't have such wonderful things back then, and a wedding was a time, one of the few times in the life of a family, that everybody got together. So a wedding wasn't a two or three hour uh, show. Weddings lasted for about a week. They'd start and there'd be constant feasting and talking and partying and dancing. It was, if you will, a reunion plus the, the joining of two families. It was a big deal. And in those days, the man responsible for paying for it was the bridegroom or his parents if he was very young. He footed the bill and the responsibility was to make sure that this week-long celebration, this, this big show, was perfect. Thank goodness I have daughters, otherwise I'd be putting the bills. <laughs> so there's a wedding at Cana, and Jesus knew these people, so they must have been friends of his family or socially. Uh, they, they were, in other words, you just didn't walk into a wedding. These were people connected to him somehow, either through kinship or family or through lifelong friends or something. You just didn't invite strangers off the street. You didn't send invitations to the people in your office. This was a family affair. Almost like a clan affair. So that's what the situation is. And then it says Jesus, and then it says, and the mother of Jesus was there. You know what John does in his gospel? He never once uses the word. John, Mary never appears in the Gospel of John. She's always called the mother of Jesus. Now, there are a lot of theories why John would avoid using the word Mary. I don't know if one is better than the other. I know it's a popular custom in that part of the world that people are known after their famous children. In, in Muslim, in Arabic, you have the prefix Abu. Uh, Abu so-and-so means the father of so-and-so. Their son is so famous but they're now known by being the father of that person. Well, that's an interesting theory, but we don't see that in the Old Testament. We know all about 
Bathsheba, she had a name, and even though she had a boy named David, uh, even though she had a boy named Solomon and her husband David. So that really doesn't play across generations, but for whatever reason, Mary is not named. <coughs> well, let's continue, because this is, I think, this is either just the way the guy wrote, or he's got a point here. Why is he putting Mary sort of in the background? Why is he making it so full? And Jesus and his disciples have also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, again, the mother of Jesus, they have no wine. Now remember, whose responsibility is it to make sure that the catering comes off? It's not Jesus's. He's not the father. He's not the bridegroom. And Mary is saying to him, Jesus, there's no wine. And Jesus responds pretty abruptly. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and me? Mary's asking him to do something about it. And Jesus says, no, it's not my job. Now, I'm a good son. And if I went to a party and my mother told me to do something, what would I do? I'd say, sure, yeah, mom. And then I'd ignore her. <laughs> I mean, I think that's what most men do if their mother asks them to do something that they don't particularly want to do. They, they've learned through life, just nod your head, go along, and just do nothing. But Jesus calls his mother woman. Man, it's, it's not like, hey lady, I mean, it's not a put down, but this is not a term of affection. It's not Abba, Father, Daddy. He's calling, he calls in other places the Lord God, Daddy, but he's calling his mother woman. He's a, again, we've got a distancing between Jesus and his mother for some reason. And then Jesus says, what has that to do with you and me? Well, that phrase appears five other times in the Gospel. And what is so telling and striking that each time the phrase appears five other times, it appears in the mouths of demons. When Jesus is casting out the demons who are infesting the, the, uh, the, the possessed man, the demon speaks, Jesus, what do you have to do with me? It's the same phrase. And what it means is, this is none of your business. Demons say that to Jesus, you know, we are, Satan is the prince of this world, you're interfering with our work in this world. And Jesus responds to his mother the same exact way. Again, this is not, you know, we've just had Christmas two, three weeks ago. We had the mommy and the baby and everything that's all sweet and lovey-dovey, and now he's grown up. <coughs> and we don't have that intimacy, it seems. But not only, now, if it were me, I would go, yeah, ma, sure, whatever you want to do, and then ignore it. Jesus says, no, I'm not going to do anything, and then he goes ahead and does something. So he doesn't get credit for it from his mother, but nonetheless, he did it. What did he do? And he said to her, woman, my concern, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Now what is that? In the homes of wealthy people, in Jewish people in that time, they didn't have indoor plumbing. And Jews, good Jews, washed. Not because they were afraid of germs, but because of the ceremonial laws that if you hung out with a Gentile, if you touched money, if you were, if you were near anything, that was contrary to the laws of Moses, you would be polluted, ritually polluted. And if you polluted, if you were polluted, you polluted everybody around you. It's the cootie system. And to undo that, you had to have water that you would ritually bathe in. We do that at Holy Communion. John Bordeaux's gonna hold a little bowl out, he's gonna sprinkle water on my hands, and then I'll take the bowl and do it to him. We're not doing that for sanitation. I use the hand sanitizer. We're doing that to be washed ritually clean. It's the same sort of practice, and you need water. 
And you can't have clay jars because clay absorbs whatever it's in it. So if you've got a jar full of oil and it's empty and you fill it with water, the water tastes like oil. Stone doesn't absorb. Stone was required by the law. And stone is expensive. They didn't have ready quick cement. These had to be carved by masons. So you've got six of these cisterns, if you will, collecting water for ritual purification. So you know this is a big house. You know these are people who need a lot of water. You know this is the local big way. And Jesus says, fill these jars to the brim with water. And they're filled with water. Now he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So the servants have filled the water, and then they take it out again. And when the steward tasted the water that had become wine, he did not know where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everybody serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Now Jesus did this the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. It's the changing water in the wine, but you notice Jesus didn't say anything. No magic words. He didn't touch the water. Jesus, the only words he said were, no, Mom, I'm not going to do it. And then he tells the servants to fill it up. And the servants do all the work. And the head waiter is the one who finds out the miracle. And Jesus doesn't say, look what I did. But rather the servant. He just told him, hey, so what? Do we take away from all this? For me, at this stage in my faith life, where I come from and is in the beginning of this, woman, what does that have to do with me? If you look at each of the Gospels at the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry, he says and does things that are sound downright mean to his mom. Now, is Jesus best being an obnoxious teenager? No, he's an adult man. But let's look at some of the other things that we've come across in this early part of his ministry. If we go to Mark's Gospel, Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside they sent him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around, he said to them, Here are my mothers and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. As for Mark's gospel, Luke's gospel, we have the same sort of statement in a different form. While he was saying this, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. Anyone know their own Catholic prayer? prayer? Hail, Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou above all women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus Christ. It sounds like this, but what does Jesus say? But he said, Blessed are those who obey, hear the word of God, and obey it. Jesus is saying in this, in Luke's Gospel, it's not Mary who by dint of being my mother is the most blessed, but those who believe me are blessed. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus is saying it's not my physical brothers and sisters, my biological relations, my mother, who are going to be saved because they're my family, but every one of you who believe. And now in John's Gospel, Jesus is distancing himself from his mother, not by putting her down, but by saying, woman, and raising everybody else up to him. See, the Jewish religious world at that time meant that you were saved by biology. You were a Jew, therefore you were saved. You followed the laws, but that was the only door in. And what Jesus Christ is saying now in all three Gospels is it doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what race. It doesn't matter your biology. If you have faith, salvation awaits you. Jesus says this at the very beginning of each of his Gospels. That there are no insiders in heaven. 
There's no first class saints and second class sinners. All who have faith are before God. And the only one there is not your mother, not the saints, not the Virgin Mary, not your priest, but Jesus Christ. He's the only mediator and advocate. Christ is turning the world upside down by saying, it doesn't matter where you've come from. You can be from the wrong side of the tracks, from the wrong side of the blanket, just have a horrible family. You can be a prince of the land. It doesn't matter. What matters is what you believe. This is the power and the message of Jesus Christ, that all people, all sorts, can and will be saved if they believe. <laughs> Very, very frustrating at times to have to talk about this because I want people to be saved who are just like me. Because well, I'm going to be saved, aren't I? Because I'm such a nice guy. And I've paid all my dues and I've worked this hard. Well, friends, it doesn't matter. We have Jesus' parable about paying workers. Some guys showed up at 6 a.m. and worked all day. Some showed up at 4.59 and worked a minute. And Christ pays them the same. And he tells those complaining, I didn't promise you extra pay for extra hours. It's either in or out, saved or damned. It doesn't matter when you jump on the boat, so long as you're on the boat. Oh, this can be very frustrating. We want there to be a system of checks and boxes that we fill out. And if I do this, if I'm like this, and if my, all that. Jesus tells us from the very beginning of his ministry, that's the old way. If I'm a good Jew, if I follow all the laws, if I can trace my genealogy, if I keep clear from foreigners and Gentiles, and I purify myself, and I do all these things, and I give so much of a set amount of my income to the poor, then I shall be saved. And Christ, using the very instrument by which a, a mechanical salvation works, this purifying water, this get-out-of-jail-free card that only the rich can afford, because poor peasants do not have the wherewithal to have six stone cisterns, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Just think about this for a while, if you are a former Baptist. Six cisterns of 30 gallons each means 15,000 servings of wine. Must have been a pretty nice party. <laughs> Jesus Christ, from the beginning of his public ministry, teaches us it's not who we are, but what we believe. And what we believe needs to be in Oh, I want sometimes, I'm so tempted by a mechanical system, because then I don't have to worry. If I do X, Y happens. If I spend so much time here, do so much work there, do this, do that, the other, say the right prayer here, be nice to the right guy, salvation is mine. It doesn't work that way. It's what we believe in our heart. And how that affects our lives is so major and traumatic. What does it mean? Don't cast the first stone. Don't look at a person and say, oh, they're going to hell. They're not as good as me. Because you don't know what's in their heart. You don't know what's in either of their faith. Do not judge lest ye be judged. Do not condemn lest ye be condemned. We as Christians are to treat each other as brothers and sisters. Jesus is not destroying the family. He's not minimizing the family. He's not saying, I have a less important relationship with my brothers and sisters and my mother than I did before. But rather, everybody who believes has a relationship equally important to me as my brothers and sisters. How does that work in our community? Well, nobody is from Lacanto. We have asked, actually, we just have two members of this church who are actually born in Citrus County. And they're each three years old. <laughs> and one was born in Crystal River and the other in Inverness.
Our families are not here. I have family in South Florida and Philadelphia and Alabama and this and that and the other. And each of us can point to that. So what does that mean? It means we as Christians have to focus on a family around us, which are our brothers and sisters in Christ, the people around us. That means that we have to look out for each other, to care for each other, to be concerned for each other. And I'm talking about the even dick we have to treat with love and decency and reflection. Of course, we all have crazy uncles, but <laughs> I'm being silly. But I think you know what I'm trying to say. Our responsibility is to the people in the pews around us, the people in the community around us. Uh, we're not members of a tribe or a caste or a club or a clan. We are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And that needs to be our focus. Remember, it's not who you are or where you're from. 